you concerning the biblical hope of immortality, a bodily resurrection. Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans 8, 24 and 25, saying, for we are saved by hope. Now let's pause on that word hope. Hope means I as a Christian have a right to expect this. But it's more than just the right to expect. It carries with it the idea of an earnest desire to receive what I have a right to expect. That's how hope saves us. It lifts us up. We look beyond the veil of tears that is this life. And we see the reward waiting. That's how it works to save us. So, but hope that isn't seen is not hope. What a man seeth, why did he yet hope for? For if we hope for that we see not. Then do we with patience. We bear up under the burdens. Wait for it. Romans 8, 24 and 25. Over the years, there have been several books, articles, and other personal accounts of people claiming to have died or undergone near-death experiences. I don't have any particular of these accounts in mind, but in all that I have read or heard concerning them, they say something like they went to heaven, uh, they saw or they visited with Jesus, uh, they saw angels or dead family members, Bible characters, and from their accounts they were saddened greatly when they were sent back from heaven to earth and reluctantly then they returned to this life. Such accounts naturally arouse our curiosity about them and people devoid of Bible knowledge people coming from various false religions, there's really no way to express what they may think about such things. And when brethren are as weak as they are today in their knowledge of the scriptures, especially in this area, you don't know all the time what you're going to learn that they think about these things. So it causes us to wonder what's going on. And it causes us to want to know what God tells us in the divine volume the book divine that we sang about a moment ago, about actually dying. Sadly, the biblically unlearned may or may do base their views of life after such things as these near-death experiences rather than on what the Bible teaches. So in this study, we'll investigate this, I think it is, most interesting subject. You know, it's not like reading a fiction uh, this is what we're going to do, folks. Every one of us, the Lord doesn't come back for us. We're going to experience this. So it seems to me that should cause us to want to understand what he who put us together and made us as we are has to say about it. Now these accounts of dying and near-death experiences are contrary to the rules of evidence, even in this life, and the Bible teaching, as I said. First, these experiences are often inconsistent with one another. That is, they contradict one another. So that alone means they can't be genuine. How would anyone know which ones are real and which ones aren't? One's experience is just as real as the next person's experience. It's all subjective and it all becomes relative to them. So how do we judge about these so-called near-death experiences? Secondly, and most important to us, is that the Bible is our authoritative, God-given resource for doctrine. It's God's Word. It's the Creator's message. If you find out anything that's true about death and dying, it's going to come from God. Because the Bible furnishes us into every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So we want to examine several passages from the scriptures as we explore this timely subject. And by the way, it always will be timely. For as far as I know, thousands die every day until it's our turn. The first and most fundamental truth is that the biblical hope of immortality is a bodily resurrection. The Bible does not teach that the soul or the inward man or the spirit 
of a Christian will at death wing its way to heaven and there forever uh, be with God without a body. Now this, this is the old Greek understanding of afterlife coming from Greek, Greek philosophers such as Plato and many others. Their concept is very different from the Jewish Hebrew way of thinking of the afterlife. Jews and early Christians looked for a reuniting of the soul or spirit or inward man. I call it the real you in the final resurrection at the end of the world. You can see that that's why some of the Greeks wouldn't listen to Paul and stopped at the moment he got to the resurrection on Mars Hill in Acts 17. The body will be raised from the dead and in that resurrection transformed to mortal, immortal life. Remember, John would say, we do not know what we shall be like, but we will be like him. You know, to me, I can stop right there. I don't have to go any further. You may need more, and the Bible does give some more. But to think about the glorified Son of God, the God-man, glorified mankind, who prayed before his death, glorify me with the glory I had with thee before the world was. Folks, that's enough for me to know that he'll take care of all of that. And there it is. So Christ's resurrection is our pattern. It is our model. Paul knew that. In writing about the resurrection to correct misconceptions and errors of it in the church at Corinth, we find 1 Corinthians 15, 20, and therein Paul explains, but now is Christ risen from the dead. Now watch what he says. And become the first fruits of them that slept. Now the idea of the first fruits means a representative sample of the harvest that would come. That's really a Hebrew idiom. And Paul, having his background and ethnically being a Jew, he's using that. Under the law, they gave sacrifices, the first fruits. I was looking and waiting for our figs to get ripe. And finally they did. And of course, like figs do, they get ripe in a hurry. And <laughs> a lot of them are every day. And I thought, now these first figs, if I were a Jew under the law that I'm pulling off of here, I'd be taking to the temple. I'd be offering and I thought about that regarding the tomatoes. I thought about that about everything else. If I was a Jew, that'd be on my mind because I love God and want to keep His commandments. So the first I would take, I would offer to God. And that's the idea that Paul presents here. But he looks at Christ as the first fruit preceding us of the resurrection where no one would die anymore and be glorified as God glorified Him. The Jewish worshipers then would go up to the temple and they would offer first fruits of the harvest to God and it would be a sacrifice. This verse Paul is saying that's the case when it comes to the death of Christ and his resurrection and then our resurrection that will eventually take place. So you know you can't just talk about death, the dying experience itself and beyond death without finally getting to the resurrection, the eternal state of the matter. So our Lord's resurrection has already taken place. In advance, as a forerunner, and we may say a harbinger of our eventual resurrection from the dead. And by the way, as I said a moment ago, each one of us is going to die unless the Lord comes back first. And each one of us is going to be resurrected. Thus, our resurrection bodies will be modeled on the pattern of Christ's glorified resurrected body. Now, I speak here, of course, to faithful members of the Lord's church and those innocent ones who die before they ever sin or they're never accountable for their actions. Paul writes much the same thing to the church in Philippi in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. For our conversation, now remember the King James conversation, for our manner of life, for our conduct in the flesh here on earth. What? As Christians, notice it's not just on earth. For our manner of life has to do with heaven. 
Our conversation, our living is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what's going to happen when he comes again as far as the faithful Christians who shall change our vile body? Nice way of looking at your body, but I think that's pretty well it when you consider it being corruptible. Our vile body, that it may be fashioned, it sounds like John, doesn't it? That it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able. I like those words. I'm not able. You're not able. All of us together aren't able. The angels aren't able. But he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Paul says then this humble, lowly, corruptible body will be transformed in the resurrection. And we shall in that body conform to the image of Christ's glorious resurrection body. Now let me ask you something. Why spend a whole lot of time in this world concerned about worldly things, including all the trappings we put on this body? I'm not talking about taking care of it as an instrument God gave us to do his work here, for we present our bodies as living sacrifices unto him. But I'm talking about simply living in our bodies as if this is all that matters, but it doesn't. We should be living in our bodies here as living sacrifices, intending to enjoy the resurrection in a glorified body because heaven's our long home. As we sing in the song sometime, in this body, in this world, we're just passing through. So this brings us uh, to the next question. When do we get our resurrection body? Is it immediately upon death? Well, it's not at death. The resurrection body is not so different body. It's this body transformed into a glorious immortal form. Paul talks about that when he says, it is sown in, in corruption. Now notice, it is raised incorruptible. Same it, isn't it? So, thus if we received our resurrection body immediately upon death, well, the graves of all the Christians would be empty. But they're not, are they? Scriptures are clear that this takes place at the second coming of Christ. Notice 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 23. And then we'll move to verses 51 through 52. In verse 21, Paul writes, For since by man came death, that's an interesting statement, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Now watch what he says then. For as in Adam all die, let me ask you this, who sinned first in the garden? Adam or Eve? Why was he? Well, why does the Holy Spirit have Paul say, for as an Adam all die? Because he saw Adam, that is, Satan did. Why? He's the head of the human race. And he just exactly had to reach the head of the human race. And that's through, uh, through uh, Eve. Uh, why was she created? A suitable help. So the Holy Spirit says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. There it is again, first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ, that belong to him, that are faithful. Revelation 2.10, Be thou faithful unto death, even if it cost you your life on earth, I'll give you a crown of life. They that are Christ that is coming. Christ's resurrection first took place as the first fruits. We are emphasizing that point. See, he's already gone through the whole thing. He's blazed the trail. Back in the days of the pioneers, they would send people out, scouts, you know, and they would mark the trails. Many times it'd be animal trails or Indian trails, which many times are the same thing because the Indians use animal trails. And over the years, those were the easiest ways to get through the wilderness that we don't realize existed in this country nowadays. And so they would blaze the trail. They would mark a tree, usually chopping the bark off on one side, and you could follow where they went. Now, growing up hunting and being in strange hunting territory, we marked trails all the time for one of us to find one another. Now, usually I marked trails as I went in so I know how to come out. <laughs> so anyway, Christ has gone ahead. He's marked the trail. He's already gone through all of it. And he did it as a man. <coughs> so, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. 
Christ's resurrection then took place first, then ours will in good time. In verses 51 and 52, Paul tells us, Behold, I show you a mystery. Now the word mystery here is not like a Sherlock Holmes mystery. It's the idea, it hasn't been revealed, now I'm going to reveal it. You haven't known before, now you're going to know it. We shall not all sleep. Sleep stands for death. But we shall all be changed. I once saw that put uh, on a nursery wall. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Now that's not the blink of an eye. Have you ever looked somebody in the eye and a light kind of glint across it? That's, that's what he's talking about. It's faster than the blink of an eye. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, which there's going to be, won't be another one, it's the last one. For the trumpet shall sound, what's going to happen? And the dead shall be raised, here it is again, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. What a thought. I don't mind telling you I'd love to experience the second coming of Christ because we wouldn't have to die, but just to be able to ascend from this earth transformed, incorruptible, meet the Lord in the air, as Paul says, so shall we ever be with the Lord in the sense of being in heaven. The most complete description of this transformation that is yet to take place, but will take place as surely as the Lord was raised from the dead, will take place, of course, at His second coming. is found in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. It reads, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, you do, don't you? Even so them also which sleep in Jesus, that are dead where? They died in Jesus. Will God bring with him? For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, now here's where an old King James Version word comes up, shall not prevent them, that is, we'll not go before them. That's what prevent means here. We shall not go before them which are asleep or dead. Well, what's going to happen? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. I don't think anybody's going to miss that. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. What a sight. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, the resurrected Christians, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's an amazing statement. Don't think we dwell on that enough in the burdens and problems of this life and the fleshly things. Ken pointed out, and rightly so, this past uh, Wednesday, you know, we've undergone a lot of suffering in the congregation. I may say if the world continues, we'll, we'll undergo some more suffering. Until one by one, we'll shuffle off this mortal core. We think about that because that's yet to experience. It's only natural being human. We think about the process of dying in the moment the spirit leaves the body and what it's going to take for this old body to die so it can leave. How much more should we as Christians be talking about when we all get to heaven? As the song says, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Paul's telling us that at the second coming of Christ, the dead in Christ will be raised first. Then those who still live on the earth at that time will be transformed into their resurrection, resurrected bodies and we shall go to be always with the Lord. I've often said... Well, you know, at the time of the coming of the Lord, you have the resurrection of those already dead. But then those alive who are faithful will be transformed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, as we read a moment ago. So you see, there's going to be a great transition by all of us. If, we're, if the Lord comes the next hour, those of us now, there's going to be a great transition. So those he'll bring with him that have died and resurrected. We'll go up to meet them. What a thought. Thus we don't receive our resurrection bodies until the Lord comes again. 
Also, I hope you noticed here that it never says the Lord will ever touch this earth again with his foot. This earth is sin cursed. The premillennial doctrine of Christ coming and setting up a kingdom on this earth is again refuted by this particular teaching also. Now, all that we've said, the foregoing, raises another question. What happens to us in between our death and our resurrection? Do we cease to exist? Then the resurrection, uh, we are recreated, which wouldn't really be a resurrection. Or do you continue to exist after death, but in an unconscious state? You die, go to sleep, you wake up, you find yourself in heaven with the resurrection, with a resurrected body. And you're not even aware of the time that's passed in between. Well, neither one of these is correct. They're foreign to the Bible. The Bible doesn't teach them. It's error to teach such. Although there are those who claim to believe in Christ who believe such things, the Bible teaches that the soul, the inward man, the spirit, separates from the body, and that's what we call physical death. James tells us plainly, it's the simplest definition of physical death I can think of. Listen to this. For as the body without the spirit is dead, and then look how he applies it concerning living for the Lord here. So faith without works is dead also. James 2.26. Human death does not mean extinction. Human death is the separation of the soul from the body. Now, in between our death and our resurrection, we will exist in a disembodied soul, a soul, a spirit, an inward man, the real you without a body, in a conscious state. You are a center of personality. You, your spirit is fathered by God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8, Paul writes, For we know, now let your teeth sink into that, not if and maybe high probability, we know, we know what? That if our earthly house of this tabernacle, Greek word is skene, temporary dwelling place like a tent. For we know if our earthly tent were dissolved, now watch how he switches. We have a building of God. That's a permanent residence. And house not made with hands, not physical, not of this age. And it's eternal, but where? In the heavens. What's the state of our affairs in this body? For in this we groan, earnestly desiring. There's rich study right there, and earnestly desiring. Do we earnestly desire to be resurrected? Do we long for that day? Are we trying to tenaciously hold on to health here? Oh, what's happening to me? What's happening to you is normal. You're dying. That's normal. Now, should we do all we can to be better and hopefully help ourselves? Well, I certainly want to. But you're not going to stop the process. You're not going to stop the process. For it's supported unto men wants to die. And after this, the judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. So, for in this body, we earnestly are designed to be, notice, clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. We want this tent again made for this world. We want the eternal permanent building of which Christ's resurrected body is the model. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. Being burdened not for that we would be unclothed but clothed upon. What do you mean? That mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing as God. Well, believe it or not, God knows what he's doing. God knew that he needed to set up a situation that is a proving ground. This life is perfect. Now let that sink in for a moment. Now I'll add to it. For what God intended to do with it. Now what he intended to do with it? Make it a proving ground. A place where we prove to him we love him with all that we have and are. And we love our neighbors ourselves. Where we use it as a schoolroom, studying his will and bringing every thought in subjection to Christ. And developing a character in the likeness of Christ. That's what it's all about. Use life for any other reason. You flunked the course of life. 
Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, therefore, in the light of these facts, from God to enlighten you and give you strength, we're always confident, are we? We're always confident knowing that, there's that knowing business again, no ifs, ands, buts, or maybes. Whilst we are at home in the body, God meant a soul to have a body. We are absent from the Lord. But we walk by faith and not by sight. You see, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's how you walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, I say, look at the emphasis. And willing, my will is to go through this. Rather, I'm willing to be absent from the body. Don't want to be absent from the body. God made the spirit to be in the body. Don't want to do that. But I'm willing to be absent from the body. And here's why. And to be present with the Lord. So when a child of God dies, he leaves the body until the resurrection. But yet he's in a closer proximity to fellowship with God. Paul is saying that it's not that we want our body to be stripped away so that our soul exists in what he calls a state of nakedness without any house. This intermediate state of the soul without a body is like a state of nakedness. That's what Paul's saying. Paul says it's not that we want that, but we want to be further clothed with our house, our resurrected body, and you have to go through this to get there. You ever had to go through anything to get to a certain point? You have to go through schools. You have to do this. You have to learn that. If you really want something, you go through it to get it if it's necessary. He says, we want to be further clothed. That's the ultimate goal. Now, the word in the Greek here has the connotation of pulling on top clothing. Sort of like pulling on a sweater over your shirt so that you don't need to undress first. Paul is saying that if he had his preference, you ever said that? If I had my druthers, if I had my preference, he would rather live until the second coming of Christ so that he wouldn't have to go through that intermediate state of nakedness or disembodied state. He says, listen, therefore we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. He wants to be with the Lord. He says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body than to be present with the Lord. You know, when Lazarus is pictured by Jesus being in paradise in Abraham's bosom in the Hadean world, Abraham says of him, now he is comforted. I don't know what all that covers. I just know it's in contrast to the affairs of this world when we're outside this body before the resurrection. It's called paradise, and we're comforted. But Paul gives this word, and it's a comforting word, that this embodied state brings us closer to Christ. And we all as Christians certainly want to be closer to Christ. Philippians 1, 21 through 24, Paul explains that when you die, this will involve then this closer, more intimate relationship with Christ. Paul contemplating here his possible martyrdom, martyrdom says this, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let me make a point. If in your living in the church now, you can't honestly and truthfully make that statement, there's something wrong in your life and you need to correct. Every faithful child of God ought to be able to say, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Listen to this. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain, he writes. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I will not. I don't know. For I am a straight. I'm stretched betwixt two. What, what, what's he stretched between? Having a desire to depart and be with Christ. Now listen to this, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is needful for you. Let me tell you something. I want you to think about it. What reason do I have to stay here in this flesh in a body that, that groans and is going to die in time except to serve the Lord and help other people go to heaven? Now you say, give me another reason for staying here. I don't know of it. If you've got another reason for staying here, I... It's not what the Bible says the reason ought to be. I want to have the same reason Paul did. And I also want to have the attitude that says, if I leave, it's far better. Thus, 
For the child of God, what awaits us when we die is this intermediate state of disembodied existence, which will bring us into a closer, more intimate fellowship with Christ. And we await in that state our eventual resurrection, which will occur when Christ returns. Now, let's look at the question, what happens to those who die lost in their sins? Paul doesn't address this anywhere in his scriptures. Whether you ever noticed that or not, he doesn't do it. He addresses only what happens to the faithful child of God. He's writing letters to what will happen then to Christians. But Jesus addressed the question. In John 5, verses 28 and 29, here's what Jesus taught. Marvel not at this. Don't be amazed at the resurrection. Don't be amazed at these things. For the hour is coming, a point in time in the future, in the which all, not some, all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. He shall come forth. Now watch. They that have done good. Well, it has to be good as God defines good. Under the resurrection of life. You see, lost people have existence, eternal existence, as those who are saved in heaven. So life is not mere duration because it's eternal death. Life, eternal life, in a glorified, resurrected body in heaven, is a quality of life. And we need to understand that. Notice, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So we pass through the intermediate state until the resurrection. We appear at the judgment bar of God to give account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. And those who serve God faithfully all their lives go to heaven. The unbelievers are cast into the lake of fire, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And that's an eternal separation. And we know it is hell. In the intermediate state, unbelievers are already in a conscious state of torment called in Tartarus, actually, in the Hadean world. The place where the rich man went, according to Luke 16, when he died. Great gulf separates that part of the Hadean world from the one called Paradise, where Jesus and the thief went when they died, and where Lazarus went and was in Abraham's bosom. And we have that in Luke 16, 19 through 26, in that given account. Some people try to discredit that by saying, well, it's not really something that happened. Jesus said there was a certain rich man. Now I want to ask you a question. Was there... He says there was and calls his name a certain beggar named Lazarus. Well, I'll ask you another question. Was there? And that shows you it's not just simply a parable. He's teaching about a count that happened. So we have then Hades being a Greek term. We get in the Old Testament, the Hebrew term is Sheol. And it has to do with the, the realm of the departed dead. Uh, the underworld of departed spirits is another way it's referred to sometimes. The rich man is in torment, not in Gehenna hell. That's the final abode of the wicked, the lake of fire and brimstone after the judgment. Different word there, Gehenna. But Tartarus is the word for torments of disembodied spirits who die lost in the Hadean world. So here's where we wait when we die. Either comforted in paradise or tormented. Now the foregoing has some interesting implications. What this means is that these people who report these near-death experiences in which they see loved ones, and family members, etc. who are deceased are not seeing these people in heaven but they're dreaming or hallucinating to say the best. Sometimes, it's always interesting to me they're never in hell. That's strange. When the Bible teaches us plainly, most people who are accountable to God will go to hell. Why don't they come back from hell? Seems to me that'd be a relief. Why now is this the case? Because these departed dead are not yet risen from the dead. They couldn't be in heaven. So what they're telling us is seeing something that's not real. They're telling us going to heaven and seeing loved ones there. But those who are faithful are not in heaven. They won't be there on the resurrection at the coming of Christ. After the judgment, come you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So, 
this intermediate state of disembodied spirits is where we're headed the moment the spirit wings its way from this body at whatever point that takes place where we die biologically. Now in summary, when a person dies, his body returns to the dust from which God made it. The soul, spirits, or inward man, the real you, of faithful children of God, or the innocent, are drawn into a closer, more intimate fellowship with Christ in the disembodied state of paradise in the Hadean world. We do not know what this disembodied existence is like. The Bible doesn't tell us. If we needed to know, God would tell us. The souls of those who die lost in sin enter into a state of conscious torment, like the rich man in Tartarus, and separation from God, which in torment is in the Hadean world, I said. When Christ returns, he will bring with him the souls of the departed believers, the faithful children of God, Christians, and undergo the resurrection, being transformed into glorious, marvelous, powerful, resurrected bodies modeled after the glorified body of our resurrected Lord. After appearing before the judgment seat of Christ for rewards, these will then be ushered into heaven. Now let me pause here and say this as we come toward the close. Why the judgment? It's not a place where you're determined saved or lost. You're saved or lost when you get there. The judgment is a pronouncement of sentence that will pertain to your place for all eternity. And it's a time of meeting out rewards. I don't know what those rewards will be. I don't know how that happens in that place. But we will be rewarded according to things on this earth. Or you'll be, if you're lost, punished according to on this earth. Remember, you're dealing with a perfectly, flawlessly, eternal, just God. I assure you, He will know how to take care of it. That's the reason He says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord, because he knows everything there is about everybody, even to the point to where he's going to punish them exactly as they need in their sins. I can't do that. Nobody else can among men. So the lost will be raised to the dead. And you don't find a description of their bodies. I don't know what that's going to be like. But it's, they're raised to the dead in bodies, and after being judged by God, they'll be cast into hell, Revelation 21.8. I know this. I don't experience that. I don't want anybody to experience that. And I've been trying to preach since 18 years old, trying to get people to accept the love of God and the grace of Christ through the gospel and live righteous so they won't have to. I know what it's like in my 71 years to be called everything under the sun because I want people to go to heaven. But I know what they did to Stephen because he loved them enough to preach the truth to them and call them what they were sinners, the kind of sinners they were, thus what they should repent of. It's sad that people won't listen to the truth, but they don't. But does that change the truth? Does it change our obligations? Does it change us in any way to turn from the way that is straight and narrow, hemmed in on all sides by the truth of the gospel? Not so. It just simply causes us to rise up and be more determined than ever to live right, preach right, defend the faith, and oppose error. If it wouldn't, what good is it? The only thing that can get us from earth to heaven to glory is loving obedience to the truth and living for the Lord here. As we conclude, what application does this have for us today? Here are simply three things. It means that death is not the end. It's not extinction. Our souls will separate from our bodies when we die physically. Our very persons are inward men. What we are now will continue on. We will exist to live forever, either with Christ or apart from Him. What that means is that the lives that we live now are infused with eternal significance. We have the awesome privilege of determining where we will spend eternity. That's up to you and up to me and all other people. Therefore, the things that we do now in this life are of enormous eternal significance because we will live forever somewhere, either in heaven or hell. And those consequences will never end. It also means that this intermediate state will bring us closer to the Lord Jesus Christ at the moment that we die. 
You know, it's said of Lazarus, when he died, the scripture says, the angels carried him into Abraham's bosom. Now you might say, well, that was for Lazarus. Brethren, I don't have a doubt in my mind because I believe the Bible. That every faithful, notice who it is, child of God, who Christ loved and came to save, and they've loved him and obeyed him and served him faithfully through all manner of things is going to have a personal escort of angels into the Aedean world in paradise. Why shouldn't I believe that? Since faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So the old Negro spiritual is not so off base at all. Talking about uh, going into heaven, there's a chariot coming to get me, taking me away, this kind of thing. Band of angels coming after me. I like that. I like to know there's an escort up there that when I die in the faith, you will escort me into heaven. Then the resurrection will bring complete physical and emotional, psychological healing. You know, we think about physical healing. There are a heap of folks bearing all kinds of scars. And sometimes they use them for their own benefit here. They become crutches. They don't try to get rid of them according to following the Bible. But if we're faithful... All that is a mess in this world and in our lives is erased forevermore. Buddy, your back hurt. It, it won't hurt anymore. No more blood pressure problems. No more whatever. It's going to be gone. There won't be any kind of troubles that keep you awake at night. There won't be a night. Just one eternal day to walk with the Lord. There won't be all the concerns about governments, and about economics, and about all that goes along with this particular life. Brethren, we do not think about these things enough in our short vapor appearance here. But we ought to, because Paul says we're saved by hope. We have, through the eye of faith, the ability to look completely beyond the veil of tears that is this life. And see the day when all tears are wiped away. And we walk, as it were, hand in hand with the Lord. Might visit Paul for a while. Talk to Abraham. David. Visit with Adam and Eve. Talk to Noah. Anybody else you want to. There's no time. You won't have to go home. You're home. And so are they. Brethren, we, we don't allow ourselves to be comforted with the things God gave to comfort. And yet when Paul closes some of his writings, he said, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. If you're not a child of the living God, how on earth can you reject these things when Christ has done so much for us that we couldn't do for ourselves? You must believe on Him, though, as the evidence of the Bible and the Word tells us. Repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess your faith in Him, Romans 10, 10 and be immersed in water by being baptized to Christ for the remission of sins. Then live faithful in the church to which He will add you till someday you'll shuffle off this old mortal coil and step into eternity. Don't you want to be ready? What about those of you who've been members of the church who just let the world sort of slip back in? And you're concentrating more now on the affairs of this world than you are knowing your Bible, living, putting the kingdom first. You're still... Living kind of like the world, aren't you? If you see particular sins in your life that need to be repented of, they're private, then take care of them, but fully repent of them, confess them, pray God for forgiveness. But if your life has brought reproach on the blood-bought body of Christ, your brothers and sisters in the Lord, then you need to make a public confession of those things, and we'll pray with you and for you, and God will hear. He wants you to be saved. He's done all that's possible to save a free moral agent. It's up to you. Choose you this day. Whom ye will serve. Because I'm telling you. Death is coming. And what then? If you're subject to the blessed call of our Lord. We invite you to come. We'll stand and sing.